Meanwhile, Odysseus and the swineherd had lit a fire in the hut and were getting breakfast ready, for they had sent the men out with the pigs. You may as I hear footsteps. I suppose one of your men is coming here, for the dogs are falling upon him and not barking. The words were hardly out of his mouth before his son stood at the door. Eumaeus sprang to his feet. He kissed his head and both his beautiful eyes and wept for joy. The father could not be more delighted at the return of an only son. The child of his old age, after ten years' absence in a foreign country, and after having gone through much hardship. He embraced him, kissed him all over as though he had come back from the dead, and spoke fondly to him, saying, So you have come, Telemachus, light of my eyes that you are. When I heard you had gone to Pylos, I made sure I was never going to see you any more. Come in, my sweet child, then sit down, that I may have a good look at you now that you are home again. It is not very often that you come to the country to see us swineherds. So be it, old friend. But I am come now because I want to see you, and to learn whether my mother is still at her home or whether someone else has married her. Oh, she is still at the house, grieving and breaking her heart, and doing nothing but weep both night and day, continually. The swineherd brought them platters of cold meat, the remains from what they had eaten the day before and he filled the bread baskets with bread as fast as he could. He mixed wine also in bowls of ivy wood, and then they laid their hands on the good things that were before them. As soon as they had had enough to drink and eat, Telemachus said to Eumaeus, Old friend, where does this stranger come from? How did his crew bring him to Ithaca, and who were they? For assuredly he did not come here by land. To this you answered, O oh swineherd Eumaeus. My son, I will tell you the real truth. He says he is a Cretan, and that he has been a great traveller. At this moment, he is running away from a Thespitian ship, and has taken refuge at my station. So I will put him into your hands. Do whatever you like with him. Only remember, he is your son. How can I take this stranger into my house? I am as yet young and am not strong enough. My mother cannot make up her mind whether to stay where she is and look after the house, or whether the time is now come for her to take the best man of those who are wooing her. Still, as the stranger has come to you, I will find him a cloak and a shirt of good work. Uh, with a sword and sandals, and will send him wherever he wants to go. But I will not have him go near the suitors, for they are sure to ill-treat him in a way that would greatly grieve me, no matter how valiant a man he may be. Sir, it is right that I should say something myself. I am shocked about what you have said about the way in which the suitors are behaving in despite of such a man as you are. Has some god set your people against you? There is no enmity between me and my people, but it is my house that is in the hands of numberless marauders. For the chiefs from all the neighbouring islands, Dulcium, Sains, Akinthus, as also all the principal men of Ithaca itself, are eating up my house. The issue, however, rests with heaven. But, do you, old friend Eumaeus, go at once and tell Penelope that I am safe and have returned from Pylos? Thus did he urge the swineherd Eumaeus. Eumaeus therefore took his sandals, bound them to his feet, and started for the town. Athena washed him well, and then came in the form of a woman, fair, stately, and wise. She nodded her head and motioned to Odysseus with her eyebrows, then said to him, Odysseus, Noble son of Laertes, it is now time for you to tell your son. Do not keep him in the dark any longer, but lay your plans for the destruction of the suitors. As she spoke, she touched him with her golden wand. She made him younger and of more imposing presence. She gave him back his color, filled out his cheeks, and let his beard become darker. Stranger, 
How suddenly you have changed from what you were a moment or two ago. You are dressed differently, and your colour is not the same. Are you some one of the gods that live in heaven? Oh, have mercy upon me! I am no god. Why should you take me for one? I am your father, on whose account you grieve and suffer so much at the hands of lawless men. You are not my father. But some god is flattering me with vain hopes that I may grieve the more hereafter. No mortal man could do what you have done. Make yourself old and young at a moment's notice. And I because you ought not to be so immeasurably astonished at my being really here. There is no other Odysseus who will come hereafter. Such as I am, it is I, after long wandering and much hardship, have got home in the twentieth year to my own country. What you wonder is the work of the goddess Athena. They were both so much moved that they cried aloud like eagles or vultures with crooked talons that had been robbed of their half-fledged young by the peasants. It was the Phaeacians who brought me here. They are great sailors and are in the habit of giving escorts to anyone who reaches their coasts. They took me over the sea while I was fast asleep and landed me in Ithaca after giving me many presents in bronze, gold, and raiment. And I am now here that we may consult about killing our enemies. First, give me a list of the suitors, that I may learn who and how many they are. I can then turn the matter over in my mind and see whether we too can fight the whole body of them ourselves, or whether we must find others to help us. Arthur, I have always heard of your renown both in the field and in council, but the task you talk of is a very great one. I am awed at the mere thought of it. Two men cannot stand against many and brave ones. There are not ten suitors only, but ten many times over. If we face such numbers as this, you may have bitter cause to rue your coming and your revenge. Turn home early tomorrow morning, and go about among the suitors as before. Later on, the swineherd will bring me to the city disguised as a miserable old beggar. If you see them ill-treating me, steal your heart against my sufferings. Even though they drag me feet foremost out of the house or all throw things at me, look on and do nothing. Then I will nod my head to you, and on seeing me do this, you must collect all the armour that is in the house and hide it in the strong storeroom. Make some excuse when the suitors ask you why you're removing it, saying that you have taken it out of the way of the smoke. There is also another matter. If you are indeed my son, and my blood runs in your veins, let no one know that Odysseus is within the house, neither Laertes, nor yet the swineherd, nor any of the servants, nor even Penelope herself. Father, you will come to know me by and by, and when you do, you will find that I can keep your counsel. Thus they did converse, and meanwhile, the ship which had brought Telemachus and his crew from Pylos had reached the town of Ithaca. When they had come inside the harbour, they drew the ship onto the land. Their servants came and took their armour from them, and they left all presents at the house of Clytius. Then they sent a servant to tell Penelope that Telemachus had gone into the country. The suitors were surprised and angry at what had happened, so... They went outside the great wall that ran around the outer court and held a council near the main entrance. Eurymachus, son of Polybus, was first to speak. My friends, this voyage of Telemachus is a very serious matter. We had made sure that it would come to nothing. Good heavens, see how the gods have saved this man from destruction. We kept scouts upon the headlands all day long, and when the sun was down, we never went on shore to sleep, but waited in the ship all night long until morning in the hopes of capturing and killing him. But some god has conveyed him home in spite of us. Let us consider how we can make an end of him. He must not escape, for we'll tell all the world how we plotted to kill him, but failed to take him. Let us try and take hold of him, either on his farm, away from the town, or on the road hither. 
Then we can divide up his property amongst us and let his mother and the man who marries her have the house. My friends, I'm not in favour of killing Telemachus. It is a heinous thing to do, to kill one who is of noble blood. Let us first take counsel of the gods, and if the oracles advise it, I'll both help kill him myself and will urge everyone else to do so. But if they dissuade us, I would have you hold your hands. Antinous, insolent and wicked schemer. They say you are the best speaker and counsellor of any man your own age in Ithaca. But you are nothing of the kind. Madman, why should you try to compass the death of Telemachus? Do you not remember how your father fled to this house in fear of the people? They wanted to tear him in pieces and eat up everything he had, but Odysseus stayed their hands, although they were infuriated. And now you devour his property, without paying for it. Take heart, Queen Penelope, daughter of Icarus, and do not trouble yourself about these matters. The man is not yet born, nor never will be. Who shall lay hands upon your son Telemachus, while I yet live upon the face of the earth? Telemachus is much the dearest friend I have, and has nothing to fear from the hands of our suitors. Of course, if death comes to him from the gods, well, he cannot escape it. Then Penelope went upstairs again, and mourned her husband, till Athena shed sweet sleep over her eyes.